talk today um, about transitioning away from the fuels of the 19th and 20th centuries, um, our fossil fuels, to what I hope are the fuels of the future um, and this current century, um, actually. Um, <clears throat> Oh, by the way, uh, after a refreshingly light um, uh, presentation with slides, uh, you know, on slides from the previous presenters, I'm really sorry because this is very slide heavy. Um, and as everybody's still eating, there's a lot of graphs. So I understand if you're not looking, uh, I won't take offense. Um, so if we're going to transition, we need to know what we're transitioning from. And I think probably uh, a lot of people in the audience will um, kind of have a, a general feeling of where we are. Um, but this is total energy consumption um, around the world, and very fossil fuel heavy, and that's uh, transportation, power generation, et cetera. Um, oil mainly used for transportation. Uh, coal, uh, lots used for electricity generation, natural gas for electricity and heat. Um, <clears throat> Nuclear power, hydro, biofuels, and waste, and other. That other, unfortunately, is uh, wind, solar, geothermal, all the uh, solutions that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, breaking it down a little bit further in the electricity sector, um, still very fossil fuel heavy. Um, I'm going to not to talk about um, nuclear power very much, and that's because although it is a, a carbon-free energy source, um, it's expensive and getting more expensive all the time, unlike wind and solar. Um, and the economics just don't work. And so we're going to have some nuclear plants. Um, countries are building them, China, for example, and I'll get into that a little bit. Um, but as far as comparing the economics of that with renewable energy, um, it doesn't come close. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that um, governments around the world uh, subsidized fossil fuel consumption to the tune of about a half a trillion dollars per year. Um, the title of the slide is Subsidizing Climate Instability, really shooting ourselves in the foot by um, making fossil fuels cheaper um, than they already are. Um, artificially cheap, by the way. Um, if we include the lost tax revenue from you know, not taxing these things, it's closer to $2 trillion, according to the IMF. Um, and that's not even uh, taking into account producer subsidies. So in the U.S., it was estimated in a recent report uh, that about $18.6 billion was uh, given to fossil fuel companies through tax breaks and other uh, financial mechanisms. <clears throat> so... Um, we don't want to spend too much on the doom and gloom, but sometimes it's good to visualize what we want to leave behind. Um, we heard a lot about climate change, but I want to talk about some effects on the landscape and human health. So we have here um, mountaintop removal coal mining in West Virginia and the spillage down of, of the waste into the uh, local um, river, riverbed. Um, burning that coal that came from that mountaintop uh, has real human impacts, uh, not only on health, but productivity. Uh, this is from the Rocky Mountain Institute. Uh, another study from Harvard Medical School estimated that it costs us about $345 billion per year just burning coal in the U.S. Uh, that's unaccounted for costs. So that's including health, health effects, uh, missed work days, um, pollution, and climate. Um, this is the uh, Alberta tar sands, probably the most flattering picture you're going to see of the Alberta tar sands. It's still pretty ugly, but we have a, a sunrise there. Uh, and also uh, indoor and outdoor air pollution. So it's estimated by the World Health Organization uh, that about 7 million people die prematurely every year because of exposure to these um, hazardous, um, hazardous sources. So let's get some, to some good stuff. Um, I start with efficiency because um, it's the cheapest energy. That's what we don't need to use in the first place because we've uh, reduced demand. Um, everything that we do in the modern economy, um, whether it's transportation, lighting, appliances, uh, et cetera, can be done in, uh, much more efficiently. We can get energy savings of anywhere from 15 to 90 percent um, <clears throat> by implementing some things that are easy and cost effective. Um, in some cases, not so easy, but uh, there are solutions there. I won't spend too much time on this because I want to get to the really exciting things happen with renewable energy. Um, 
But just to touch on restructuring the transport sector, um, we can do a lot by electrifying it, um, plug-in hybrids in electric vehicles, more light rail, uh, intercity rail, uh, high speed, uh, things like that. Uh, because as we become a more urban, society, urban species, uh, more than half of us now live in cities, um, the car is becoming less about mobility and more about uh, immobility. Uh, so we want to give all of those extra solutions, um, like uh, increased bicycle infrastructure, pedestrian walkways, making it easier for people to get out of their cars. Um, we're still going to have cars. Um, but having the plug-in hybrids and electric vehicles um, lets us imagine a world where we can make most of our short trips on wind-generated electricity, for example. Uh, and there's been some calculations on that that uh, suggest it's maybe the cost equivalent of 80 cents per gallon of gasoline um, if we charge up using wind power. Speaking of wind, now uh, I warned you about the graphs, so if you're not familiar with the units, here, um, wind power generating capacity is, uh, uh, capacity is measured in megawatts. <clears throat> um, to give you an idea of what that means, each of these turbines is probably, you know, an average turbine is probably two megawatts or so. Um, so you get an idea of the numbers involved here. And just because it fits better on the slide, I use gigawatts. So you just divide the megawatts by 1,000, and that's what's here. Um, the main point is the trajectory and how quickly this is rising worldwide. Um, <clears throat> doubled since 2009, and now we have more than 85 countries generating electricity from wind power. Um, the capacity installed at the end of last year uh, could meet residential electricity needs in the European Union, so powering every home in, in the European Union with wind power. Um, a lot of countries are starting to dispel the myth that you uh, can't have a lot of renewable energy on the grid at once. Um, Denmark, for example, is number one. 34% of its electricity came from wind last year. Um, their goal is 50% by 2020, and that's going to be mostly through offshore wind farms. Um, <clears throat> Portugal came in at about a quarter. Uh, Spain almost beat nuclear power with wind power last year. It came within uh, less of a percentage point. Um, Ireland at 17%. In Germany, which the national rate is about 8% for last year, uh, four northern states get over 50% of their electricity from wind regularly. Um, UK, UK is uh, right behind Germany. The US and China, um, you know, bigger economies, uh, much smaller percentage so far of wind, but that's uh, changing quickly. So here's a look at the leaderboard of wind power uh, worldwide. China has just rocketed up past the United States and Germany and Spain in a um, very short amount of time. Um, they doubled their capacity every year since to, uh, from 2006 to 2009. Um, <clears throat> and their target right now for 2020 is 200 gigawatts of wind power. Uh, to give an idea of you know, what that equates to, that's about as much electricity as all the homes in China use, or uh, all of the electricity generation in South Korea, um, approaching all the electricity generation in Brazil. Um, so you kind of get a sense of the scale and how quickly this is going to play out. If, <clears throat> excuse me. One more thing on China. The, the government has become uh, really serious about developing its wind, and so we've got these, what they call wind power bases, seven of them in six uh, very windy provinces. Um, the unfortunate part is the best wind resources tend to be in remote areas far away from populations, so they need to build out these transmission lines to get that power to where it's needed. Um, and that's why they're building the world's uh, largest ultra-high voltage network um, <clears throat> to get that power there. Um, this is uh, something we did earlier this year, looking at how wind has actually gone past nuclear power in terms of electricity generation. <clears throat> China's building the most nuclear power plants of any country, um, but because it takes so long to build a nuclear power plant, um, and because uh, the Fukushima disaster in Japan kind of made them take a pause and say, okay, well, we're going to um, suspend our permitting for new plants for a while to make sure that we're uh, doing things safely. Um, <clears throat> all of those things are slowing down their nuclear development while wind is um, blowing right past it. Um, it's a bad pun, sorry. 22% um, more uh, wind power than nuclear in 2013. So to the United States, 
um, number two, 60 uh, gigawatts of wind. Uh, Texas has a fifth of that, 12 gigawatts. Um, and if it were its own country, it would be right between the UK and India uh, in terms of generating capacity from wind. Um, we now have nine states that are more than 12% wind powered, uh, including Iowa, which is over one quarter wind, and we expect that they'll hit a third of wind power, uh, of wind generated electricity in terms of their total generation in 2016. Um, wind's becoming much more competitive every year. Uh, with traditional sources, the, the prices of wind generated electricity is down 40% in the last four years. Um, and in this picture, uh, this is, I think, from France, so it doesn't quite fit, but it was a good one that I found. Um, kind of puts, uh, brings the point across that while wind farms can cover a wide area from you know, start to finish, they really have a small footprint on the ground, and so uh, farmers and ranchers can still grow crops or raise cattle or do whatever um, on the rest of their land and get the royalties from um, leasing their land for the wind production. Um, last slide on wind. <clears throat> this table blows me away every time I see it. Uh, all of the top 10 leading carbon emitting countries in terms of fossil fuel burning uh, could meet all their electricity needs from wind, um, uh, onshore, offshore, or a combination of those. Um, China, the factor is about 10 times what their 2010 electricity generation was, and in the US it's about 20 times. Uh, so you get an idea, kind of the scale um, and the abundance of the resource. Um, I want to talk about solar, um, and some of this might be old news to um, people in the audience have been talking to some people that I think know more about solar on the micro level than I do. I take a, a much more global approach. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in case people are wondering, you've got the familiar solar panels on the roof. They're made up of many cells. Um, and you can hook those into uh, systems of multi-kilowatts on rooftops to hundreds or thousands of megawatts um, on wasteland or um, wherever in, in the desert, uh, for example. So world photovoltaics installations, a very similar pattern on the graph um, over the last 15 years, 14 years. Installed capacity doubled from 2011 to 2013, and another way of saying that is in the last two years, more PV has been installed than was previously uh, before 2011, since the invention of the solar cell. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, one reason for the rapid build is the price of solar cells, solar panels, um, and PV systems uh, keeps on going down at a rapid rate. And you know the price since 1977 breaks through my uh, title bar here, but you can see the, the trajectory and we're still um, going down at the end there. Um, Germany uh, leads the world, has led for quite some time, largely because of its feed-in tariff policy, um, where producers of electricity from renewables are guaranteed uh, a price for their electricity, guaranteed access to the grid. Um, and this is a policy that's been adopted by uh, dozens of countries worldwide. Um, they're starting to uh, ease back a bit, along with uh, Italy and its feed-in tariff. Um, and as they do that, they're starting to level off. I think that's going to be more temporary than anything because of how quickly the prices are going down. It just makes more economic sense every year <clears throat> to do it. But China and Japan, meanwhile, are rocketing up and the U.S. is finally starting to uh, realize some of its potential. And I say finally because of this map. So <clears throat> we compare the solar profile of Germany, uh, how much sun hits the ground uh, per year. And that's about the solar profile of Seattle. Um, <clears throat> almost everywhere in the United States, we have better solar resources than Germany. It's just that we haven't um, been serious about <clears throat> uh, installing more solar and taking advantage of that resource. Um, briefly back to Europe, um, Italy is getting nearly 8% of its electricity from solar and Germany about 5%. Um, European countries still, although they're slowing down, are uh, in the six of the top 10 countries in terms of capacity. Um, in the US, as I was saying, we're uh, starting to wake up, uh, grew 65% in 2013. 
Uh, California has almost half of the solar power installed in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> part of that's because of uh, their state law that requires 33% of uh, the electricity that utilities sell uh, to come from renewable energy by 2020, uh, called a renewable portfolio standard. 29 states now have that, uh, as well as D.C. Um, We've also got a new business model, or new business models, uh, solar leasing companies, so people don't have to foot the entire bill for a, a solar system they want to put on their roof. Um, companies will do, uh, do that for them and then finance it. Um, and again, costs are coming way down, so distribute is another way of saying uh, basically rooftop solar, um, down 44% since 2009. Uh, now we get to the uh, Asian superpowers or emerging superpowers in solar. Um, 2013 was the first year in more than a decade that Europe wasn't the top region in installing solar power. It was Asia, and it was because of China and Japan. Um, <clears throat> China has led for a better part of a decade in terms of producing the solar cells and panels that we you know, see on rooftops, but not so much installing them because it was too expensive to really take hold. Um, those days are really over. They installed more last year than any country ever has in a, in a single year. Um, now they have 18 gigawatts. Uh, that's about half of what's, what Germany does. And in May of this year, they announced a new target of 70 gigawatts in 2017. Um, so if they meet that goal, that's adding as much in four years as the entire world had at the beginning of 2011. Um, Japan is also growing rapidly, doubling last year. Um, it's been the number one rooftop market in the world for a long time, um, but because of a new feed-in tariff after the uh, Fukushima disaster, they want to promote more solar power. Um, that's encouraging larger projects to go in. Um, India is a country that has enormous potential, um, and installing more solar could really help out a lot of people. Uh, 300 million people lack electricity in India. Um, so as part of a way to address that, they've introduced this national solar mission, um, which was extended by, or ex excuse me, um, increased their goal by more than half uh, with the new uh, administration of Narendra Modi. Um, good news about solar in India, uh, it's, and in many places around the world where there's no central grid or, or power plant, um, it's often cheaper to just do solar uh, village by village or rooftop by rooftop uh, than it is to build out that huge infrastructure that you need to get people on a, um, a, on a grid. Uh, solar power is also cheaper than the diesel generators that um, power a lot of India and kerosene. Uh, one interesting point, uh, earlier this year it was announced that the government's going into a public-private partnership with uh, irrigation manufacturing company and solar manufacturing company. Um, and uh, this was touched on earlier, the overdraft of groundwater in farming and how uh, rapidly their underground aquifers are being depleted. Um, this is a triple win um, where the government says, okay, we'll help you as a farmer buy a solar powered irrigation pump um, as long as you switch to drip irrigation, which is much more water efficient and you don't get any loss in yields. And so the farmers um, are using less water, there's less fossil fuel use, and the government saves uh, up to $6 billion per year in subsidizing uh, diesel fuel and uh, grid electricity that would be used in that irrigation system. Um, briefly, I want to touch on concentrating solar power. That's the other way that we uh, generate electricity from the sun. Um, <clears throat> much smaller than PV so far. Um, most of it's in Spain and the United States. And uh, one of the reasons it hasn't gone as far as PV is that, uh, well, it's more complicated, but it's also, uh, and it's more expensive. Um, one advantage it has is that you can use uh, molten salt solution to store the energy that's made um, during the day and then use that to generate electricity after dark. Um, moving to energy within, within the Earth. So this is a pretty staggering figure. Um, in the upper six miles of the Earth's crust, we have more energy, 50,000 times more energy than all the oil and gas reserves of the world. Um, but relatively little developed so far. Um, one of the main reasons, again, is cost. Um, unlike wind and solar, you can't just <clears throat> go to a site and measure it very easily uh, what your resource is going to be. Um, there's a lot of exploration that needs to be done, and it's very cost heavy uh, at the beginning of a project. And so that's discouraged uh, rapid build out. Uh, 
so the U.S. is number one, uh, about a, uh, more than a quarter of world installed capacity for geothermal. Um, and if we include the Philippines and Indonesia, it's more than half of world capacity in just those three countries. Um, I included this map just so you can see the uh, volcanically active re regions of the world where geothermal is uh, most viable. Uh, Pacific rim, rim of Fire here and here and through the Mediterranean and into the African Rift Valley. Um, some countries, again, are getting very high rates of their electricity generation from geothermal. Um, El Salvador and Iceland at about a quarter, and the Philippines, uh, 17%. Um, there are about 40 countries that are estimated could get 100% of their power from geothermal alone. Um, and it's not just electricity. You can heat greenhouses, heat homes, um, and use hot baths, like uh, very popular in Japan, um, with geothermal energy. Uh, Iceland is really the poster child for geothermal. So you've got 25% uh, electricity and 90% of the homes heated with geothermal. Um, so the question after introducing all these things is, can we do what we need to do with renewable sources, with non-carbon sources of electricity uh, and energy? Um, and there are many studies that show, yes, we can do that. This is one of my uh, favorites because it lays out all of the material needs um, and uh, the scale at which we would need to do everything. Um, and you can't see it probably from where you are, um, but it says barriers to the plan for powering the entire world with wind, water, and solar power um, are primarily social and political, not technical or, or economic. Um, so that gives a sense that, yes, things are possible if we get serious about it. And so that, uh, that can give some hope. Um, their plan is to have all of the old energy replaced by 2050. I think it's going to have to happen much quicker than that. I think it can happen much quicker than that um, if we do get serious. So this has already been touched on a few times today. Um, something that could help accelerate that process is uh, a carbon tax. Um, Basically, the fossil fuels are um, very artificially cheap. Um, the market tells us they're cheap, and we make bad decisions because of that. Um, what we want is a market that tells closer to the ecological truth. What's, what does it really cost uh, to burn coal, to uh, run our transportation sector on oil? <clears throat> um, and as was mentioned, uh, Economists, by and large, support this as a, a, a way to go. It's relatively simple, as long as you can you know, make it into law. It is simple to implement um, and is equitable. Um, it, was, uh, it was said that you know, polls, public opinion polls on, on dealing with climate, perhaps um, don't show the amount of enthusiasm that you, know, you would need to get something like this done. But there was a recent U University of Michigan poll saying that 60% of people in the United States would support a carbon tax if the uh, money went to renewable energy. Now, this, is, this isn't the revenue neutral carbon tax um, that Sadir was talking about, although uh, similar um, support for that. Um, but this includes 70% of Democrats and a majority, just barely a majority, um, a majority still of Republicans um, supporting that carbon tax. Um, another way that could help accelerate this energy transition is redefining what we think of as uh, security. Um, armed conflict uh, is seemingly everywhere if we watch the news, and of course it's, it's a big concern, but I would argue that the real problems uh, facing humanity and risking our civilization are carb uh, climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, overfishing, overplowing, all of these uh, different environmental issues. And if we were to uh, shift some of that military spending, uh, of which the U.S. is $640 billion more than the next nine countries combined, if we were to shift some of that to uh, other activities that address the root problems, um, for example, about $30 billion per year could eliminate energy poverty, could eliminate uh, <clears throat> Uh, the problem of not having access to electricity it could be low carbon off grid, uh, totaling $586 billion by 2030. That's, a one, that's $586 billion total compared to, uh, if you remember the figure from fossil fuel subsidies, $544 billion per year um, to subsidize our own destruction. 
Um, I think I'm r rapidly running out of time, so um, if anyone's interested in the Deutsche Bahn um, story that I thought was pretty inspiring, uh, let me know afterwards. <clears throat> I wanted to talk briefly about Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign. Um, <clears throat> so this is one of the pieces of the puzzle where um, we're getting a great grassroots anti-coal movement together, um, coordinated by the Sierra Club, but involving many different groups, uh, people concerned about human health, agriculture, um, environment, and climate. And this week, the uh, city of Missouri announced that its two coal plants are no longer going to burn coal by uh, January 2016, and that makes 170 coal plants uh, that have said they're going to retire uh, since 2010. Um, so lastly, um, I think one of the questions that come out, comes out of this conference is what can we do uh, about these issues? And, and you've already um, come to the right place. You're taking action already. Um, but, uh, and you're going to see some of these organizations, I think Sierra Club's coming tomorrow, Citizens Climate Lobby and others, um, get involved with them. Uh, and uh, I, I have a feeling I don't need to prod you too much. I think you're all kind of motivated to do it already. Um, <clears throat> lastly, you know, we can all change light bulbs and do everything in our power as individuals to reduce our energy consumption and carbon footprint, but it's going to take real system change to get where we want to go. And that's why getting active is so important. Um, I'll leave you with one quote from my boss, Lester. Saving civilization is not a spectator sport. Uh, and that gets to that activity theme. So thank you very much, hopefully, for the new perspective.